Kor Cholim. The Kor Cholim is visiting, the mitzvah visiting the sick. This is based on a few parshas ago, uh, Vayera, when Hashem visited Abraham when he was sick. What was he sick from? Yes. Uh, yes. 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 So he, had, he had a minor operation and he was, um, maybe not so minor, and he was uh, resting up. He was in pain on his third day and Hashem came to visit him. And from there, we learned that um, we're supposed, just like Hashem visited Abraham, we're supposed to visit people and be with them while they're sick. Now, this is often understood as a, uh, it's kind of like, um, intuitively, we could assume that this is something we should do to be good Jews. What I like to argue today is that it's not just a good, kind act, it's a mitzvah, and with all that entails. Meaning it's a mitzvah. There's a debate whether it's from the Torah even, or it's from the rabbis. Um, but when we consider it as a mitzvah, that means that um, it's not just, there, there, are, there are guidelines for how to do it. And what I'd like to present to you is that there's three, three, three to four categories of um, details in how we perform the mitzvah. And within those categories, there are many details in how we can best perform the mitzvah. So what I'd like to do today is present that to you. I'd like to go through the sources of, of this mitzvah and also uh, share with you how to do it in the best way and also discuss a few interesting cases. So if you look on page one, uh, let me share, uh, the source sheet is in the, is in the chat section, but I'm also gonna share my screen with you uh, for those on Zoom at home. Um, so you can, also, um, you can also follow. Okay, so take a look here on, um, let me share my screen. Okay, so this is what we wanna to do today. Um, Genesis of Jewish values, be carefully visiting the sick. All right, uh, there are enough, there's first sheets, I think, over here. I think you can, I think they're over here. Um, so we want to talk about um, the sources, we want to talk about the purpose of Bikorchalim, what are the reasons for it, we want to talk about two unique cases, can you perform Bikorchalim over the phone or via Zoom? Like, if it's a technical mitzvah, are you able to do it over the, over Zoom, is it, is it, is it on the same level? Is it not on the same level? We're gonna talk about that. What about a non-responsive person or a patient? I worked there for a while. I spoke about this once in show many years ago. I don't know if anybody remembers that, but yeah, I guess not. So it must've been very impactful. <laughs> anyway. I wasn't there, okay. that's why. So uh, it was a few years. So I spoke uh, about my experience as a host. I worked as a hospice chaplain for a bit, um, one summer, for a summer before I started working at BT. And a lot of our visits were to non-responsive patients, people maybe in um, um, advanced stages of dementia or Alzheimer's, and they, they couldn't respond to us. So can I perform the mitzvah? Should I perform the mitzvah? Or how can I perform the mitzvah with somebody who's non-responsive? So those are two questions, two cases we're gonna talk about. And, what I, what I, and then we're gonna talk about um, insider tips for, for, for performing your core holding. I was so, trying to make it have, quieter. Is it too loud? Are we are we okay? Can you hear us okay, Eva? Oh, okay. Out of here. Okay, we might want to see. Is it okay? The sound. Okay. Um, all right, muted. The sounds okay. Okay. Good. Okay, so we have a, we have a bunch to cover. So the main basic idea is that um, the mitzvah has a physical and a spiritual component. And I think that these components are hinted to in the sources that are brought for Bikur Cholim. That's basically our first part, sources for the mitzvah. And again, what I wanna show is that it's not, it's an obligation and that's the obligation. It, there's a lot of details that go into it. So if we wanna do, just like we wanna um, be careful with chametz in a very careful way to clean our homes and to buy the right matzah. With Bikur Cholim, we should see it that way. There's a lot of details that are connected to this mitzvah and we should see it not just as a kind act, which it, which it is, but also as an obligation and with all that entails. Okay, so uh, the first source that I want, uh, I want to discuss with you for Bikur Cholim is, is in Genesis. And that's how I was able to teach this class in this format. No, joking. But, um, but actually, I want, this source actually is pretty central for the whole, for everything I want to say about Bikur Cholim. So the, it's the Lord appeared into, into, into Abraham, um, and the tabernacle of Mamre as he sat in the tent door in the heat of the day. This is the third day, the day was in most pain. Hashem came to visit him. 
you know, the language, how does Rashi know? How does the Gemara know that, um, that Hashem is doing Bikur Cholim here? Uh, because it says that, um, it says like this, the Rosh says that um, it doesn't say, Shalop, it doesn't say, it says Vayera, God came, God appeared. It doesn't say that God spoke. It doesn't say that God um, taught. Uh, it doesn't say that God, um, lo, amira, lo it doesn't say that God spoke. It says that God appeared. And the Rosh says from here, we see that Bikur uh, Cholim can take, he says, Ladam, um, it's like this. So, um, the language here is God appeared to him. And from here, we learn that God didn't just have prophets, that God actually came and appeared to him. And the language of appeared is very important for us, for this class, because God didn't speak to him. God didn't do necessarily an action. God appeared. And this is basically the foundation for all of your core holding. Presence. Appearing. Being present with the individual that you're, you're, you're visiting. Um, a story connected to this, which I shared back when in, in that, uh, that's our Torah. Um, basically, I, uh, when I was serving as a hospice chaplain, uh, my mentor told us to go visit people. If they speak to you, if they don't, just be present. That's the idea of Bayera, God appeared. God didn't speak. I just was there with me. And so I struggle with that because, you know, I, I guess I was new to chaplaincy and I, I uh, wanted to always say, like, kind of say the right thing, you know, offer the right words, you know, to be a good, to, you know, to be a good chaplain. And I didn't understand that a lot of chaplaincy, a lot of, a lot of this mitzvah involves just being present. So there's this individual I will visit weekly and he didn't, see, I sensed that he didn't really like me. That's what was my sense because he didn't really want to speak to me. Perhaps, I know he was in a, he was in hospice, he was in advanced, advanced stages of, um, he was suffering from cancer, kind of like advanced stages of that. Um, but I visited during the first day, he kind of chatted with me a little bit. Um, and then it was just quiet. It was quiet for like 10 minutes. It was very awkward for me to sit in that silence. But I remember what my mentor told me to be present, appear like Hashem did with Abraham. And so it kept doing this week after week and uh, our talking got less and my sitting and quiet became more. And uh, by the end of the weeks that I was visiting him, my, my chaplaincy was over and um, he, actually have, he actually sadly passed away and uh, near the end. And I was chatting with the family. I was like, you know, this gentleman, we call him John. He's a very nice man. I'm happy I got to meet him. And they share with me, they go, he was really happy he got to meet you too. And I was surprised. I was like, and I kind of felt like I was failing with my visits, but her feedback, my mentor kept guiding me to just be there with him. And they share with me that he found it very valuable that somebody came and sat with him weekly. I was just there with him. Maybe he didn't feel like talking. Maybe he didn't have energy. He was just happy I was there. And so I learned from that. I mean, I learned from many of the experience, but especially from that experience that um, a lot of the visiting, a lot of the, the, the core holding that we do um, is, is, isn't limited to what we say. A lot of it's about presence. So this, I think, I think this is what this source signifies. The idea that God appeared. Now, there's another source for Bikur Cholim, uh, which appears uh, on your neck. It's 1A. And that is, um, it, love your neighbor. Okay, That's another, myth, another source. Again, these are sources from the Torah. This indicates that this is a mitzvah that, can, that goes back to the Torah. Right? So it's an important thing. It, it has a lot of details. So this is what the Rambam says in Laws of Mourning. This is one D. Because visiting the sick is one of the ways to fulfill. Um, I think somebody has their. Uh, visiting sick is one of the ways to fulfill the myths of loving your neighbor. This is the Rambam. It is a positive commandment to visit the sick. Comfort the mourner, bring out the dead, bring the bride of the chuppah to have guests. These are all physical acts of loving kindness, and they have no measure. Even though visiting the sick is a rabbinic decree, it is derived from the verse, love your neighbor as yourself. Anything you want others to do to you, you should do to your neighbor. Okay, so here's a question for you. So you, I will believe because we're all human, we've all had times when we haven't felt well. So think back to when you weren't feeling well. Think back to people who were there for you when you were not feeling well. Think back to how kind, what, what made you feel good when you weren't feeling well and they came to visit you, perhaps they reached out to you. Those, that feeling that you felt, that support, that good energy, that's what we should try to do with other people. So I think it's value about this source, number one, 
it's, uh, it, it continues the idea of being present, but it's also taking it, making it a little bit more concrete. We should be involved in actions and engagements that will enable the other person to feel good. And how do we define that behavior? We can define it based on what we would like to have done for ourselves. So let's say there was that one time you really couldn't get out of bed, you were suffering, you were in so much pain, and just someone came and they brought you some chicken soup or some uh, tofu so soup or something like that, something <laughs> even, right? They brought you some tofurkey on, on uh, Thanksgiving, <laughs> something like that, right? So, but seriously though, you can think about that and think about how that, like just that one person who reached out, just that one person maybe texted, they made you feel good. And think about that when other people are in pain. You know, it's, it's, not, it's not easy, especially post COVID. And I'll share it personally. Pre COVID, I remember like I was like all over the place. I was, uh, we're in, we're every, every, well, many week, many Sundays I was in Levendale just visiting our people there, uh, Sinai Hospital, going to people's homes. And like we've shifted a lot, I think, since COVID and kind of like become um, comfortable, familiar with not really going out. And uh, if you're comfortable going out, or if you can, or even if you're not fully comfortable, there are creative ways to still reach out. I think we have to kind of remind ourselves this could be like a refresher to be engaged in this mitzvah. So I'm, I'm saying that to myself as well. I love you. I was just, I think you have to be careful though with anything that you would want others to do to you, you should do to your neighbor. This is something I learned in that, for example, I I like certain things, but then I know other other people when they're sick, they don't want anybody near them. Yes. And so you have to understand what they want. That so it takes it a step further. Sure. Because maybe if you do what you like, they hate yeah, it. Yeah, that's true. That's <laughs> a really good point. So it's, that's yeah, you have to be careful. That's a good point. With that statement. That's a very good point. Yeah. I, I would assume the Ram Mom kind of meant that. Yeah. But then it's complicated, like how you yeah. find that. Yeah. yeah. Because you would not want to feel uncomfortable and you don't want the other person to feel uncomfortable. So you should try to seek out ways that would enable them to feel comfortable. I think that's kind of like what he's saying. Yeah. Um, okay, that's the second source. So these two sources are about physical ways to, to perform Bikur Cholim. The third source for Bikur Cholim, um, and there, there are a few other ones. These are the three I'm highlighting. Um, deal with it more on a spiritual, on a spiritual, on a spiritual level. And it says like this, um, basically, it says like this. Um, what is the meaning of that which is written after the Lord you shall walk? Um, is, it is it possible to follow the divine presence? Is it possible to, um, what's, what's the language here, actually? Um, if you actually walk after God, you can't. God's invisible, right? So the, the, the understanding is we have to follow God's ways. That's how we walk in God's ways. So how do you walk in God's ways? So in the Torah, God does a lot of test it. Um, so it says like this, um, follow the attributes of the Holy One. He clothes the naked, right? So in Garden of Eden, so we should clothe the naked. God appeared, God does, God appeared, that's the source that we, that we brought. So you should visit the sick. Um, God consoles mourners, so we should console mourners. God buries the dead, so we should bury the dead. Basically, Bikurcholim is a way for us to um, become like God in a way or act like God. What I want to point out from this source, I think it takes another level, the mitzvah Bikur Cholim is a, is a chesed, is a kindness to other people, but it's also it can be a spiritual engagement, right? And I've experienced that um, through being involved in Bikur Cholim. Sometimes um, you, get, you can become very energized from it. That can be a sign, perhaps, that you're involved in something very spiritual. It's not just you, you bring in someone some soup. It's, it's you're involved in spirituality. Um, I've also experienced that the Talmud says that when you're visiting somebody who's not feeling well, um, the divine presence rests upon their head. Ever heard that statement before? So I've, it means that their God's very close to them. And if you're engaged in the group holding, you can draw closer to God. I remember there was one time when I was involved in chaplaincy that summer, um, I was sitting in this woman's room and uh, I, she was a non-responsive patient. Um, and I was sitting there and I felt very close to Hashem, so close to Hashem I found myself singing uh, with, with that individual. Oh, I, I was singing to that individual. Maybe they were singing inside. Um, and I felt like just so elevated from the experience. And so Bikur Cholim isn't just, it's a mitzvah. It's performed with our bodies, but it's also spiritual engagement. And so these two components of physicality and spirituality, they're going to play themselves out in the reasons for why we perform Bikur Cholim. Okay, so that's kind of like my overall instruction through the sources of Bikur Cholim. So here's my question for you, without looking at the source sheet. What are some reasons uh, why we, we should perform Bikur Cholim? 
So what would you think? Like what, what let's name a few reasons why Shem, why, why would the Torah or the sages uh, command us, su- strongly suggest for us to be involved in this mitzvah? What do you think? I was, I was thinking loneliness in general is just a horrible thing. To remove, to help the person not feel lonely. Yeah, but more, more so when, when you think, and it's really easy to say, oh, they're sick. They won't even know if, they don't yeah. know if I'm there or not, you know, but they do. Mm-hmm. Yeah, fun. In a way, it's a mitzvah that might be hard to repay if you yourself never get sick. So uh, those mitzvahs mean a lot more, like a a Leviah Hema escorting the dead. That's a a perfect example, but I think this is an example as well. So it's it's like an altruistic kind of thing. Okay, it's like an altruistic mitzvah. That's good. Yeah. And Um, as you were saying, you actually you are repaid for how it makes you feel. So it helps you grow as well. I, I think so. When you reach out and you're helping someone, I always feel better. So that's already it going. It gives more. me a purpose. Correct. Yeah, uh, that's already going to be a. It's a little window into part of my answer to engaging with a non-responsive person. Um, that the experience minimally it can transform you, but we're going to see that it can do more than that. Yeah. yeah. I think we know that. Because they don't respond doesn't mean they don't hear you. So correct. that's what they, the doctors always tell you that they could be hearing you and just so not a, responsive. So once we, so um, we're going a little ahead of ourselves. We're going. I want to present to you first the different reasons that people that are offered in our tradition for why we do it quickly, and then we'll analyze the cases based on those reasons. Okay? And again, those will will all sprout from the physical and spiritual sources that we saw. Um, any other? Yeah. So right now we're on reasons. Yeah. So there's an expression: there's strength in number, and when we come together, there's more energy and more positivity. So, just so strength. Uh, people coming being together with somebody that can positive energy. Okay. So getting being present physically with the individual, or come or being connected to them, can uplift them because just having more people around is helpful. Yeah. Any other, um, anyone on Zoom want to chime in? All right, so those are really good reasons. Um, I'll just, so let's let, let's jump into the reasons I brought here and see, uh, basically a lot of them are mentioned, a lot of them can be included in, in, in these reasons that are offered. Now, there's a whole, the Dafyomi right now, it's on um, the Darium 33 and 90, uh, all right, let's just see. Not 34, sorry. I'm one behind. Okay, so I didn't do today's. Um, I was preparing the class, so mostly last night, but don't worry. Um, anyway, so um, the Darium 39, which is in five days from now, the Dafyomi, the page of Gemara that we study a day, is on, is on before Holy, and it stretches for like two pages. So that Gemara has the big chunk of material on this topic, and it's fascinating material. So anytime you see a source here that I don't bring um, a reference for, it's from the Darium. And so here's the first one. The first one is uh, Rav Acha Bar is 2A. The first reason is basically offering support and presence, meaning being there for somebody, showing them you support them and being present for them. Okay, this is the first reason. So Rav Acha Bar said, anyone who visits an ill person takes from him one sixtieth of his suffering. You go visit somebody who's sick, you take from them one sixtieth of their suffering. So the sages ask, and this, this is from the Tamu, the Dharan, sages ask, oh, that's interesting. Okay, so... Uh, they're pretty good at math. They say, well, if we go there with 60 people, we're going to cure everybody. Let's take a group of 60 people all around town. You're going to cure everybody. So they answer creatively. They say, it's not that you remove uh, another 59, 59 parts, but each time you have another 60th of what's left. So, but nevertheless, the idea is the more, I think it's the idea that you were <clears throat> was talking about, that number, numbers coming in and, and supporting somebody um, can help alleviate their pain it can uplift them. And so that's what the rest of this source says. Rav Achabar, as they say like this, the sages said to him, if so, let 60 people enter to visit him and stand him up and restore him to health. And so the Gemara says, Rav Achabar said to them, it is like the, the tents of the school of Rabbi Yehuda Nasi. It said that each one of his daughters inherits one-tenth of his possessions. His intent was that each daughter receive one-tenth of the remainder after the previous daughter took their portion. Okay, that's basically what we said. 
But what I want, I'm bringing this source as the like the um, the the main the primary source for this idea that when you go visit somebody, as more the more people that come to visit, the more you're able to remove some of their sickness from just from being present and from from like um, having that connection. It's just the idea of support and presence. Now, there's another reason why we should visit the sick, not just because we want to uplift their spirits, and there are many ways to do so. We're going to see that in a moment, but also because we can physically help them. Right? Sometimes when you visit somebody, and we, we, we were, did this a lot in hospice, I mean, we weren't nurses and we weren't aides, but if I came into a room and I saw someone needed something, and I wasn't like, a, 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 like their intense, intensive manual labor, I could shift them or, I, or I'd provide them or if they needed to, uh, uh, something to drink, I would provide it for them. Sometimes I come into a room, and it was very dark, and I'd ask them, would you like me to open up the shades? They open up the shades and there's some, some light. So this is, goes beyond support and presence. This is about physically helping the person with what they need. And this is really relevant, not, not as a, cha a chaplain, but as a family member, right? So you have a family member who's not feeling well, your spouse or grandchild or whoever. So you can, you can you're, the Torah commands us to do this so that they can have their needs taken care of. And we are the ones who are to do that um, based on this mitzvah. So the case, that I, the case in the Gemara that I brought that, that demonstrates this is a really interesting case. So I'm gonna read the English. This is on page four. This is, um, so I'm gonna, sorry, I'm gonna share this on the screen here. Uh, page four on top of the page, this is 2C, a uh, 2B, sorry, 2B. I know, I, I was trying not to say it, but um, somebody. <laughs> All right, so it says like this. Avchelbo fell ill, okay? Uh, Rav Kahana went out and announced, Avchelbo fell ill. There was no one who came to visit him. They went out, hey, we have somebody who's not feeling well. Can somebody come and, and, and help them? Nobody went. Rav Kana said to the sages, didn't the incident involving one of the students of Rabbi Akiba who became sick transpire in that manner? It was a case like this, where, some, where they, they asked if anybody could come and help a student of Rabbi Akiva, and the same thing happened, but guess what happened? Rabbi Akiva stepped in. So let's see the case. It says like this. In that case, the sages did not enter to visit him. No one wanted to visit. Maybe they didn't want to visit. It was uncomfortable. They're comfortable in their homes. Um, this is also relevant for shivas as well, or somebody's, you know, and um, it's, it's hard to leave your house and go to a shiva. It's hard to leave your house and visit somebody. It's even hard sometimes to make, to text or to call somebody who's not feeling well. And perhaps the sages weren't even afraid here of, of contracting something. Perhaps they just were very busy. Okay. So Rabbi Akiva took it upon himself. So Rabbi Akiva entered to visit him. Rabbi Akiva said, no, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do the mitzvah and instructed his students to care for him. He said, all the students come and care for him. And they swept and sprinkled the water, water on the dirt floor before him, and he recovered. So it's very interesting. The language here is, um, in Hebrew, it says like this. It says, um, lefanav. They read su lefanav, before him. So it's not clear who this before him is. It could have been before the patient, or it could have been before the people who were attending to him. Which is very interesting. So, so I'll give you an so sometimes as chaplains, you go into a room, or as family members, you go and tend to your family member who's not feeling well in the hospital, let's say. Sometimes your presence, just being there, can give an indication to those who are supposed to care for them that they should step up their game a little bit. Right? So physically being there can enable you to um, help them, provide them what they need. This is what Rabbi Kiva did. Rabbi Kiva stepped in, he just come and say, I'm present. He did more. He, he swept the floor. He's Rabbi Akiva. He swept the floor. He, uh, he sprinkled water on the floor and the dirt floor before them. And he made the room more tidy. Right? So that you come in and someone's not feeling in their room. There's like tissues all over the place. Uh, you, know, uh, you know what it's like. Uh, it's, you know, it's maybe a little smelly in there. Right? So you can come in and if they're comfortable, you crack the window a little bit, turn on the light, clean up a little bit. That can enable someone to get healthier in a quicker way. I think this is what Rabbi Akiva was doing. This is his, his form of doing that. What I think is very special about this text is you can read it. He swept before him. It could be not just before the patient, but before those who are attending to the patient who are, supposed, who are around the area. They saw Rabbi Akiva doing all these things, and they were encouraged to help. I think as, as family members or as loved ones or as people come to help other people, when there's sometimes, sometimes you go and you try to help your loved one, there's people, uh, that the nurses are very busy. So that's just going there and being present can encourage them to take your patient, your, your family member more seriously. So this, again, it's all connected to this idea of not just being present or supporting, but also physically being able to help them. That's why Shem commanded us to this mitzvah. So you can physically 
be there to help the individual. The final reason that's all, another, well, there's two more. The, the final central one that's offered for this, for this mitzvah, which is, which is not, under, not, uh, not intuitively understood as a reason for the mitzvah, but it actually is, and it's, all these appear in halacha, is so that we can pray for the individual. The Torah commands us to go and visit them so we can see their status. We see their status, we can pray for them properly. So, and this is actually part of the mitzvah. So when I visit people, I try to offer prayer, either with them or on my own. If everyone has their own comfortability when it comes to prayer. But if you want to do it in its full way, according to the Jewish texts, I'm really supposed to offer a prayer up. It doesn't have to be like a whole, you know, it doesn't have to be like a, you know, a Chazana Albrecht type prayer. It could be simply like, Hashem, please help them feel better. Simple. Hashem, please send them a refuah shleima. Or if they're very in a very advanced stages and, and you know um, that it's very, very that maybe that it's imminent that they might pass away, you, you could still pray. You could say, Hashem, please send them uh, <clears throat> comfort. Or, please, or if they're very, very close to transitioning, um, you could say, please help them have an easy transition. There's a, a lot of different prayers that you can offer. Okay, but what's most important is in this um, it, is that according to this approach, the reason why Hashem commands us this is so we can we can properly assess the reality and pray for them. They need prayers, and so we're, we that's part of our role as someone is doing before Cholim. What's the source of, again from Nadari, from the same source that we're going to learn in a few days in Dafyomi? Source says like this: um, On Rav, on the first day that he was ill, he would say to his family, "Do not reveal to any person that I am ill, so that his luck should not suffer." So he didn't want them to know. Um, so maybe he would get better. It wouldn't become a big thing. So it would just maybe like, you know, uh, be overlooked and nobody would know about it and he would get better and people wouldn't worry about it. From this point forward, when the situation deteriorated, he would say to them, go and proclaim in the marketplace that I'm ill. As thereby let all who hate me rejoice over my distress. And, and why do you want that? Because um, when they do that, God will turn his wrath from, fr uh, from him because God will have mercy. But also, and let all who love me pray that God have mercy upon me. Okay, so let people know that I'm sick. Why? Because they can pray for me. Prayers help according to our tradition. So this is another reason why we why we uh, do biblical holding so that we can pray for the person who's suffering. And the Ramban says in his Torah Adam, he says, Wow, somebody who went, they visited, they were present, they swept the floor, they cleaned up the tissues, they, they brought chicken soup, but they didn't pray for them. The Ramban says you didn't do the, you didn't properly do the mitzvah. Okay, so you do your best, you know. If if prayer isn't so much your thing or you struggle with that, uh, you do your best. But I'm just saying, the, the optimal way to do it is to also offer prayer if you can, or maybe read a, a, a capital to Hillel. Yeah, whatever you can do. So we're going to offer uh, practical tips for this uh, in a moment. The final explanation for why we do big portfolio is so that we, we can become better people. And this is mentioned here. And so the Gemara brings a lot of reward rewards for this, uh, in, uh, in, in rewards for this mitzvah. So here's one example. And who visits the ill is spare from the judgment of Gehenna. Okay. So you, you, will, you will not have to suffer, you, you will not have to suffer uh, su um, the afflictions of hell or Gehenna. What are your reward in this world? The Rav continues, his reward is written, the Lord will preserve him and keep him alive. Let him be called happy in the land and deliver, deliver not you him into the greed of his enemies. I, the Lord will preserve him from evil inclination, keep him alive and spare him from suffering. Let him be called happy land means that everyone will be honored from their association with him. And, and so companions like those who counsel in mind to seek a cure for his leprosy from Elisha will happen to associate with him. I think all of these explanations are rewards in this, the Gemara talks about rewards in this world. If you pay attention, a lot of them are practical ramifications, not so that God comes down, swoops down and, and you know, gives you a tribute or a reward. Rather, these could be direct um, outcomes of your being engaged in this mitzvah. Let's take a look at them. The first one is, um, the Lord preserve him from the evil inclination. God preserve you from doing something wrong. If you're actively involved in Bikur Cholim a lot of the time, your nature will become a little bit more refined. You'll be thinking about other people and you'll be protected from falling prey to like negative thoughts or, or selfish behaviors. That's a, that's a positive uh, out, outcome of Bikur Cholim for yourself. Another one is, um, you'll be happy in the land. Okay, um, that's that is true. The more you engage in, in chesed and kindness of other people, your spirits will be lifted. And you'll, be, you'll be you'll feel better. Um, what's the other one? Uh, you'll be, people will be honored uh, from their association with you. 
Okay, same idea. And you also feel people, uh, companions, uh, people want to associate with you as well for, for being cured. Basically, the idea is the more, the more good you do, the better person you'll be. Okay, so that's, uh, that's like a little bit um, connected to that. Yeah. When you say a person's name every day, either in Tehillim or in Rafa'enu, you are really connected to that person. Mm -hmm. You feel you have a stake somehow in their recovery, in their health. It makes a very big difference. And God willing, they do recover. If they do, you, you feel like you've done your part. Yeah. But you are really connected to that person by doing So that. there's a certain, also like certain satisfaction or certain, like you're, you're talking about the... The more you pray for the, the more you pray for the more stake you feel in theirs. Well, when you do it on a regular basis, when so the you more sensitive you become, in a way. got that name on your lips yeah. every day, you're thinking about that person, and hopefully it will lead you to reach out as well and maybe make a phone call which you haven't gotten to yet. Yeah, but correct. Something like that, but you are connected to that person. So, um, what I want to so any uh, anyone have any other uh, things they're thinking about right now before I shift to. Um, the next part. Okay, so basically, those are the reasons. And what as if I have many details for how we can go about doing this in the best way. But my, my main goal is that we're thinking about this a little bit more. That's my hope. Um, post COVID, like I said, it's, it's a little bit we get a little bit used to not going out, not extending ourselves as much. So this is my hope that through this discussion, it'll be on your mind. If you don't remember all the details. Uh, that would be great, but most, most likely you won't remember all the details, but just this idea that um, it's an important mitzvah that we should be extending ourselves to go and do it. And I'm going to provide for you many, many ways to go doing that, ways to go about doing that in a moment. But let's take these reasons. Let's analyze two test cases, okay? Uh, first test case is calling over, Bikor uh, Cholim over the phone. So let's think based on our four reasons. Again, what are our four reasons? The first reason is presence. The second reason is physically being able to help them. The third reason is prayer. They want to know what to pray for. And the fourth reason is that it helps you. How uh, calling somebody when you can't visit them or perhaps just calling them when you can visit them. How, how much are we performing the midst of based on these different reasons? Anyone want to take a, take a jab at it? Uh, based on these reasons to see if we're fully fulfilling the commandment or how far are we going with it based on these different reasons? Yeah, Audrey. Well, you're obviously not fulfilling, uh, actually being present there. I mean, you are being present on the phone. So, maybe so what level pre is that present? What is that? What kind of presence? So maybe it's semantics. You're, you're present on the phone, but you're not physically present, which I think is much more comforting. To have a physical presence. Mm -hmm. um, what about the second reason, which is physically being able to? Well, you can't. You can't. Yeah. So you don't. You, you don't. Yeah. So you're not totally fulfilling all of these. What about the third one, prayer? Uh, I, sure. I think you can certainly offer a prayer. I, you know, you could do that even not on the phone. Correct. Um, some say that before calling the purpose of going in person, so you see what's going on. Oh, right. You so maybe it's better when it come to use Zoom you saying you're for that able, purpose than Right. You're not able calling. to assess it so that you know what level. Yeah. Meaning prayers. for your prayers to be as powerful as they can, it's, it's, it's ideal to be around them to see what's going on. Mm -hmm. So perhaps Zoom can help you deal with it, or FaceTime. Yes, it doesn't fulfill all the things too, but see, right. but this is far better than a lot what most people do, which is, and I think we have to always remember that, you know, you've made the effort to reach out, you've made the effort to let the person know that you're thinking about them, you can talk with them, you can't physically know what's, how they're doing, but you can discuss it with them, you can see where you can help, maybe you're uncomfortable being physically around somebody who's ill, this is the best that you could do, so that this, even though this isn't fulfilling completely, this is certainly a great effort. 100%, so there's, there's when you can't do it, right? You're uncomfortable being in person or something's withholding you from doing it. There's that situation, there's that reality and there's a reality when you can, but this is what you're able to do right now or what, you know, within your, your schedule. I, what I wanted to show actually is that you are fulfilling it because we have these different components which are being fulfilled. Perhaps it's not the ultimate optimal 
way to do it. Um, but if, uh, but you definitely are able to achieve a lot of these goals through doing it. So that's my suggestion. Do it. <laughs> Make a phone call, text, reach out, Zoom, FaceTime, all these ways you can achieve a lot of these components, a lot of these goals through doing it. Um, I'll bring, bring you an example just from a week and a half ago. So we have a congregant who, um, who is not in good health at all. And I have made it, um, a, I made it like a, a goal of mine to, or I've taken upon myself to reach out to them via text. Uh, so I got their WhatsApp and so I'm just trying to stay in touch with them to see how they're doing. Um, one day I reached out, it was like a week and a half ago. And I was like, how, how has your day been so far? Um, and she was like, I'm having extreme trouble breathing. The doctor's um, are not answering me. The next appointment that I have is in a month from now. The only next one they have is in a month. So I'm getting worse. And like, they were, uh, it was, it was leading them to despair. Like she was, she was in dis great despair, almost like wanting to give up. And I'm really happy I reached out. I mean, you can't, you do your best. You know, there's a lot of people, we all have our obli life obligations, but I'm really happy I reached out. She texted me back. She goes, I'm going to urgent care. I'm going to the hospital right now. And she went to the hospital and she was able to get the attention that she needed. I'm, I mean, I don't know what would happen if I didn't reach out, you know what I'm saying? But like reaching out to her, let her know somebody cared. She was in a funk. She was declining and she couldn't get help from the doctor. We should have energy to make all the calls. But the moment that someone said, I reached out to her and she felt like somebody cared just through a WhatsApp text, which I, I, it wasn't even a, a recording. It was the that encouraged her to go get the help. She went to the hospital, she was there for a few days. And she's back home uh, and she's not, you know, she's still not doing well, but like at least she was able to tend to things that need to be tended to. So this is the idea of you can achieve, that was presence, that was care. Maybe I, I didn't get to physically, you know, move, you know, move around and our help physically help her, but enable her to get physical help. Um, and so a prayer too, you know, I, I got to know a little bit more of her situation. So that's uh, and it hopefully maybe a better person. So all those components can be achieved. Ideally, if you can go in person, that's great. But you can achieve them also. Um, the uh, the uh, other <laughs> other modes of uh, communication. Yeah. I just wanted to say that um, after my father passed away, after the shiva, uh, there was Rabbi Steinberg, who was the uh, rabbi here at the time, came, called me the week after shiva, and said that you know if you're busy and people are occupying your time and helping you through that thing, but it's the week after that is so important because you're really all alone with your thoughts yeah and i thought that that call and it was a call in many ways mid-afternoon was more comforting and just I, I have never forgotten it and i do try to do that um with people, even if i make a shuttle phone to follow up the week after um just to see how things are going and that was a call mm -hmm. for sure that's that's the uh... That's very powerful. That's another way to go about being there for other people. Um, so that's that, so that was that question. So if you look in the text that I brought here, um, this this Rob is basically saying like the best way to do it is in person. Um, kind of dealt with it based on our reasons, which is interesting. You can take a look at that. Uh, in cases one cannot actually visit the collab, for example, when a visit uncomfortable patient or one, one should call. And I would argue that you can achieve a lot also in those ways as well. Um, okay, we're going to do uh, our, cl um, know, our class goes to no, 10 20. 10 20. Okay. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to try to answer. Okay, I'm going to try to answer this. Use it wisely. Yeah. <laughs> um, Thank you. That's no, good. It's good that I asked. Um, okay, so I'm going to try to answer this but one. Since you're covering so Rabbi Walbert, we can go over time. So we're, we won't go too over. We're fine. Um, so be corresponding with a non-responsive person. Let's think about it from these, from these same reasons. Okay. So support and presence. So do, when you're sitting with somebody who's non-responsive, it could be a, a family member, it could be a patient, it could be uh, uh, congregants, um, those visits are really important. Um, when you're with them, do they know you're there? What What do you say? What, yeah. what do the doctors say? What do the scientists say? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Probably. What does the doctor say? So 
And I, I can give you a, I can give an example. Um, my patient was totally unresponsive, comatose, responded to nothing. And I walk into the room one day to see him. My brother was bleeding when I walked in like that. And he had a tear in his eye. And I was curious, hey, so this is what happened. And she told me that right before I was there, the house staff, the interns, read him for there, discussing his, his case and what they would find through the autopsy and cut him open like that. That's trauma. Oh, yeah. oh, 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 but it's true. But it shows he heard, he heard, he heard them talking, wow. even though he could not wow. at all. Wow. Yeah, yeah, so when I was in Chaplaincy, they were they were like presenting us studies that I, it's, I think the science is there's still discussions around it. You're saying I science say, is that I say always operate it as living your So so based on that, for sure, sitting with a non-responsive patient or a family member, loved one, um, they can feel your presence. They can they can feel your if uh, your touch. You know, um, I'm. In my chaplaincy program, they say that the, the, there's discussion around this. You know, the science, there's different right. approaches to it, but that, but we should assume that we, that if they can sense what we're doing, we should act in that manner. So we would hold hands uh, if the family wanted us to um, talk to them, just sit next to them, let them know that we're there with an eye patient. Uh, physical assistance, so it depends, whatever their needs are. Um, prayer, so that... That's a, that was a big part of our visit, my visits to people who were not responsive. Uh, I didn't have much to do there. So I would hold, try to hold their hand if I could, um, or maybe just share some nice words. But I did a lot of prayer. I would read to Hillam, and you know, I would pray for them. Uh, hard to know what to pray for sometimes. That's what I put here. I would pray uh, in those cases when I was working as a, as a hospice chap, I would pray for them to be comfortable. I would pray for the Shen to be very close to them. There's some prayers that I would offer. Um, so, but if you, if it's somebody who you're hoping for a recovery, you can pray for that as well. And I will, I'll, I'll show you some texts, some, some, um, to Hillem that are good to say in a moment. Um, of course, I think this is actually improves our, our midot in a, in a, maybe in a better way, because it's, you talk about altruistic acts, you're not really getting much response. You know, they're not showing you, uh, you know, um, appreciation. You're going, you're doing the mitzvah. So this, for sure, you'd be performing the mitzvah based on that reason. So I would say that uh, an unresponsive person um, definitely is a way, this is, um, the mitzvah would apply in these cases and perhaps it might be a little bit harder and perhaps it might even uh, improve your trait, your character traits on, on a deeper level. So those are the two test cases too, like you, you know, over the phone or with an unresponsive person and based on our understanding of the different reasons, um, the mitzvah would apply there as well. Um, so last thing, last but not least, I want to talk about some pro tips there for some tips. Okay. Yeah. And yeah, I just a personal experience. Um, years ago, my father suffered a brain injury through a fall and we were sitting in Albany med with him and he was completely non-responsive and he was hooked up to all kinds of machines. And the Chabad rabbi came in and gave me a book of Tehillim. I mean, I was sitting there, nothing to do. And it gave me something to do. Yeah, and I was very grateful. Correct. So I just, you know, sat there and I read to Helen. Yeah. But it gave the, the, the family members who were sitting there something to do that mm -hmm. was positive. Mm -hmm. And we needed something to do. Correct. Correct. All right. So here are some tips. Uh, I'm not going to go into the source, but basically the, the Talmud says, this is a Nadarim as well. It says, has no fixed measure. So what does it mean? Um, it says that, um, there's no fixed measure for the number of times I want you to visit the ill. Is even 100 times a day is appropriate. Is that appropriate 100 times to visit a sick person? When you were sick, would you want someone to visit you 100 times? Right. So, so obviously it means a case where somebody is comfortable with you coming back and visiting them, right? And there's a balance. You should, there's another text which talks about somebody who has, um, uh, talks about has diarrhea. You should not visit them because they might not be comfortable with you visiting them. All right, so that's the counter text, meaning uh, you visit as, but the idea is if they're comfortable with you visiting them or if they want you to, if they're comfortable with you reaching out to them, you can reach out to them. There's no limit to it. Like you, you can text them the next day. If you text them once, doesn't mean you're done. The mitzvah keep extending and keep up the connection. Like, like it was shared here about um, with Shiva as well. You keep up the connection afterward. Um, so, uh, this is what the Shulchan Aruch says. You can do all this. You can visit them as much as you want, as long as you're not annoying them. 
Okay, so don't, you know, that was what Audrey said as well, you know, to know what, what's best for them. Okay, this is the, um, okay. This is a, a, a tip from a rabbi who's gonna come to be a scholar residence here this year, Rabbi Weiner. He's an awesome, uh, he's a, the, the head, head rabbi at Sinai Hospital in LA. He has a, a you know, he's in charge of all the, all the chaplaincy there. Um, and he, he writes on topics connected to Judaism and mental health and, and um, end of life, and all kinds of topics like that. So he says, let them lead the conversation. Chaplains have a rule, which really applies to everyone. So this is on the top, again, we're in the category of, of um, in the category of support and presence, okay? I'm gonna go through each of these categories and offer a few details, and we're gonna be done by 1225. So I'm gonna offer details for each of these categories. So our whole class basically revolves around these categories, support and presence, physically helping, um, prayer, and then things you can do for yourself. So we're gonna talk about tips based on that. So the first tip we offer was to keep up the connection beyond that one visit, if you can. Do your best, or more you can do the better. Okay, but just don't be annoying. Okay, um, so let the person lead the conversation. Chaplains have a rule. Uh, to, well, we want the person we're visiting to lead the conversation. Walking and saying, how are you? is not a great way to start a conversation. It's interesting, right? Instead, I always suggest starting with, I just came to wish you well. Then be quiet, let the person lead. Be a good listener. The three most important words you can use are tell me more. This is a nice tip, right? Um, it's hard to know what to even say. Just being present is good, okay? But this is another way to encourage them to speak, um, to be, uh, just sit there and I came to wish you well. I mean, it's okay. To, I, mean, I often didn't say like, how are you right now? I sometimes open up a conversation like, you know, what, what, was, your, what was your day like so far? It's not, not a judgment thing like, oh, it was good or bad. They brought me food and then I can get them talking. So um, this is what I mentioned, just showing up. Okay, that's important. Um, <laughs> Some, there's some shivas that I go to that I really don't know what to say. And truth is, I don't really think I say great things. But I'm happy, the family's often happy that I'm just there. If you just show up, it's a big thing. So sometimes people get caught up a lot in what they have to say, what they should say, and it withholds them from showing up. Showing up is the most important thing, physically. If someone sees you there. Um, sometimes your words are going to sound good, sometimes they're not. That's okay. As long as they see that you're there, it's a very big thing. Um, Okay, stay at a distance if needed. So this discussion in Jewish law uh, when it came to COVID, um, we have before, we had the midst of visiting the sick. On the other hand, the midst of to protect our health. So how do you balance these? Um, so the, the Rama actually seems to say that if we always were worried about being uh, uh, something being contagious, we wouldn't have the mitzvah at all. That's what he said. It's like an extreme statement. But many of our contemporary rabbis walk it back and they basically say like, if you're afraid of, if you're afraid that it might be contagious, your health might be harmed, um, you do not have to do it, uh, do it in the, in the classic way, but we should try to find alternative avenues to still do the mitzvah, okay? So during COVID, uh, uh, during the thick of COVID, uh, many of us will go visit people, our rabbis will go visit people and we stay, in, I remember, remember this, you know, it wasn't too long ago, you'd stand like, you know, 50, 50 feet away, Hey, like, hey, and that was like so good. Remember that? I was like, I saw somebody, right? So we used to do that. Um, my one of my neighbors, um, she turned ninety, and she was she couldn't leave her home because she was she was elderly, and she really she was she's a very sociable person. And so um, there, there, uh, her, her net her nephew is a BT alum, and he came to visit. He likes to rap. He's like a rapper, like writes raps. I like the beatbox. You don't know, know that. Mm -hmm. So we did we on our 90th birthday. We came and uh, we did like I beatbox, and he did a rap for for 90th birthday, <laughs> and it brought a lot of simple. And so we were all afraid of being next to each other. So think, think if we can think creatively of how to do it in a way that you could still show presence, but in a way that they feel uh, uh, recognized. That's a big thing. Yeah. When my husband died during COVID, we couldn't have a shiva. So we did some nights over um, Zoom, where people Zoomed in and we talked it. But it was very hard not to have any shiver or not to have anybody around you at all. Yeah. During sure. that time. It was, sure. it was yeah. yeah, I'm sure a lot of people uh, relate to that. <laughs> um, so here are a few technical things you can do. Um, when I was, I haven't done this in a while because I haven't been, I, I used to have many, I used to have a stack of, blank get well cards in my car, right? From the what dollar store. Oh, okay, sorry. Anyway, 
but still. Um, what? Yeah, they're nice. So uh, blind card, and I fill in. When I got to the places, fill. I hope you feel well. It's, you know, it's a very simple, easy thing to do. So you just have them in your car. That's a simple way to help somebody feel well, and then they have a memory of you uh, when you leave. And you can bring stuff for them to read. You could bring food. Uh, oftentimes, it's something I would do. It's just, these are all in the category of offering presents or, or helping them or, or, or being there with them. Um, oftentimes, um, some of these people who are not feeling well, they have certain songs that they like. So if you're a good singer, that's one thing. If you're not, you can find the song on your phone and play them the song. Um, another thing is take interest in their interests. So I had this one, uh, and while I was in chaplaincy, this one woman started talking to me about how she misses her cats. And I was like, this is a cat. How can I like, how can I relate to her? It's like, I was like, I miss my turtles because I had two turtles. She had two cats. And like, then we like became friends. So, um, so I know you have to find an entryway sometimes to talk to somebody. So that was the entryway. And so find things that they like to talk about. Maybe they like to talk about stamp collections. Maybe they like to talk about uh, the Baltimore uh, sports teams in the 50s. You know, everyone has their thing like to talk about. If you can, try to talk about them. That can lift their spirits, let them know that you're listening. Um, there's jokes. Sometimes if they're, um, just be careful to make it a good joke because you can make uh, bad cases where my bad jokes have made their situation worse. No, not really. <laughs> um, but uh, also another thing is fill in on what's going on in, in the world. So people like to, oftentimes with their comments, like, so what's going on at Shul? I don't know. There's not, sometimes there's not really that much going on. But sometimes it's just like literally go through. On like Shabbos, you read this Parsha. Um, this person got an aliyah because they're out of it. So you just want to feel like they're part of. So you can just literally describe basic things of what's going on in the world. Oh, this person got elected to office or that per or this person sold the stock went up. Just talk about basic things that are simple to you, but person's outside of what's going on. You let them in on the inside. Um, so here's just a few things in terms of physical assistance and it will be done. Uh, um, you can help raise or lower the bed, brighten up the room. We talked about this tidy up. You can help them eat or drink. Again, you can remind doctors, don't you know, do it in, in the right way, you know, but just your presence. Again, we mentioned, this is the category of helping them physically, right? Not just being present, helping them physically. Um, we talked about a lot of these. Uh, by you taking impeccable care of your loved one, uh, those there see that, and uh, that can encourage them, hopefully, to take better care of your loved one. Finally, prayer. Um, one thing that we pray for is we, we include them among the sick, other sick of Israel that offers more merit. That's one way to pray. Tehillim, you're a good, you're some good Tehillim, 23, 121, 130. Those are ones that are often read. Um, Shira Malo, Shira Malo, Shira Malo, uh, Mizmola David, the ones that are often read. Um, you could say a simple prayer, again, it doesn't have to be very elaborate. Um, you could sing with them, which can be a form of prayer. You can give tzedakah. These are all spiritual reasons, prayer, uh, spiritual ways to help. Give tzedakah. Uh, we talked about what do you pray for. And then there's one more search is, don't, don't base your prayer simply upon your state. Let's say you go visit them. Ah, they're doing well. They were doing well today. Or they're doing really bad. Know that they're not feeling well. And keep praying for them if you can until they're, until they're better, right? Some days are better than others. So don't base it simply upon that visit. That, that's the source here. So basically, just to sum up, we opened our class talking about basically two, two categories, physical and spiritual um, sources for a before calling. Um, the physical one, we saw at basically translates into um, offering physical presence or actually helping them in different ways. The spiritual one is more about prayer. We also talked about that it helps you yourself. Maybe through these physical and spiritual acts, you become a better person. And then we offered, uh, we talked about two test cases, two cases over the telephone or via Zoom or non with a non-responsive person. We talked about perhaps it's better. You can to be there physically, but over, over the phone over Zoom is a great way to do the mitzvah when you're strongly encouraged. Um, and then we talked about tips for going about doing it. And the main idea I wanted to impress upon all of us and upon myself as well is that we got to get out there. We have to do it. There's a lot of ways to do it. Be creative, be thoughtful on how you do it. Or if you're not creative, you're not thoughtful, just show up. Right? It's most important is to show up. It's a mitzvah. It's a kind act, of, but it's also a mitzvah. It's from the Torah. The rabbis indicated how we should do it. And we should take it seriously because it can change, it can change other people's lives. Thank you very much.